Hi everyone, this is Jim McNeil, and welcome to Good Clean Energy. So years ago, I, I went to a mentor of mine, and I told him about a challenge I was having. Eli said, Jim, sit down. Because did I ever tell you about the merchant that was walking through the forest on the way to the market? This merchant was walking through this path in the woods, and he heard a man cry out, and there was a miser sinking in quicksand. And so thinking fast, the merchant went over and reached out his hand, and he said, give me your hand. And the miser looked up at him and shook his head violently. The merchant was like, what the heck, you know, here, give me your hand. And the miser looked up at him and said nothing. He said, for pity's sake, sir, he goes, take my hand. And the miser reached up and grabbed his hand. So Eli looks at me and goes, now do you understand? The miser's not going to give you anything. All he can do is take. It's all in the way you present it. It's all in the way you present it. And this is something that the founding director of Drawdown Labs has learned firsthand. Walking into a boardroom, trying to convince leadership that it's in the best interest of the corporation to drive towards net zero. Today we're joined by co-founder of Drawdown Labs, Jamie Alexander. Jamie works directly with corporations to think beyond net zero and convince boardrooms that caring for the climate is good business. She's gonna walk us through her journey of working to educate corporations on the positive economic and societal benefits of becoming more sustainable. So corporations getting serious about the energy they consume, where it comes from, and what they're putting back into the atmosphere and can figure out how to do this in the next 10 years as opposed to the next 20. We learned in today's conversation that 75% of the emissions that need to be cut need to be cut in this decade. So having a 2050 net zero initiative is not terribly useful or productive. Having a goal to get there by 2030 is a hell of a lot more applicable. Today, Jamie asked the very, very difficult question. Are climate change and capitalism compatible? Is there enough economic incentive to get a board moving in the right direction to actually reduce carbon emissions? Can a quarter by quarter cadence of business be compatible with a five or 10 or 20 year outlook on what we have to do to address climate change? These are some of the questions that Jamie's dealing with. Jamie, it's a pleasure to have you here today. It's great to be with you, Jim. Thanks for having me. You bring with you such an unlimited list of topics. <laughs> I mean, if you look at Drawdown, which is the New York Times bestseller that was put together by a broad team of researchers, it's a bit of a how-to positive manual of how to deal with climate change, is it not? Yeah, I'd say it's the the comparison we make is it's sort of the the nouns. It's sort of like the what, what we need to do about climate change in one place. And then our work since then has been focused on the how. So how do we bring those things into the world at scale? So what are the top things on the list of drawdown was really dealing with emissions, right? That's, I think, number one paramount on the list. Absolutely. So what role does your organization play in dealing with that number one priority item? Yeah. So our early work really looked at, okay, we need to address the sources of emissions, right? So reduce and avoid the sources of emissions. And that's job number one, priority number one. And then we also need to support the sinks, the things in nature, in forests and in the ocean that absorb a lot of that CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere. And then the third category is sort of look at broader societal changes that will indirectly and then the longer run help us reduce emissions. So those were sort of the three broad areas, but reducing and avoiding em emissions in the first place is 
job number one. And what was the impetus behind the entire Project Drawdown initiative? The impetus was really that, you know, until then, most of the conversation about climate change was focused on the problem and very focused on the doom and gloom, the horrible, you know, possible outcomes, the villains, the problems. And it was sort of an effort to say, yes, it does look very bad. And let's look at what the solutions are that we have to address it. And so we really undertook this, a global research project working with, you know, researchers around the world, indigenous tribes around the world, looking at what solutions, what practices, what technologies, what wisdom, you know, kind of already existed in the world. And are those solutions sufficient to address this problem? And we ended up determining that, yes, we have all of the solutions we need to address this problem and to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And now it's a matter of scaling them. And so our effort was really to say, yes, it's bad, but we have the solutions to address it. Jamie, in taking on this role as the leader of Drawdown Labs, what did you discover once you were in the driving seat that was different than what you thought you were going to encounter when you started? That's such a great question. So the focus of my work has really been to say, okay, we we put all of these solutions into the world, but they're not scaling quickly enough and we're losing time. And so we need to look at what tapping some of the biggest actors in society, the biggest levers in society to scale these solutions as quickly as humanly possible. And so my work is really, you know, working with corporations and investors to help guide the deployment of capital. What climate solutions, to your point earlier, Jim, not all climate solutions are created equal. Some are much more impactful and will help us see much more dramatic reductions in emissions more quickly than others. And so I think the aha moment for me was this isn't like a scattershot approach. We need to do a lot of things, but we can be much more strategic with our money And with our action and with our activism and business practice to kind of get money and corporate effort and emissions reductions in strategic areas. And until recently, I don't think that has been fully understood that we really need to rally around some key solutions if we want to see the reduction in emissions that we need to see this decade to stay within, you know, our chances of of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And so the aha moment for me was just wow, we don't have to be sort of throwing spaghetti at the wall. We actually can use the science and what the atmosphere is telling us to guide and get laser focused about where these big actors use their clout and resources. Well, it seems to me that the atmosphere is speaking increasingly with a very, very loud voice. (laughs) Right. It's getting quite hostile and angry. I mean, the the recent news is that we may cross the 1.5 degree threshold within the next five years. Yeah. And that's a lot earlier than people anticipated and even than most scientists anticipated. So there's a clear trumpet being played that says, hey, we got to do something about this. When you walked into the boardroom, I think I read that you kind of approached it the way I would as somebody who believes that economics kind of drive behavior at the corporate level. Were you disavowed of that notion? I mean, did it change from what your perspective is saying, hey, here's a good business case for being climate aware? Did you find something else? I mean, the business case is important, but I don't know that it's enough. One of the sort of insights of our initial work in the the drawdown book was to say, what do each of these solutions cost? And then what is the return on investment of each of these solutions over the next, you know, 5, 10, 15 years? And what we found was when these solutions are scaled at the level we need to and they sort of displace business as usual, we will actually see a 5x return on investment over the next 20 years, which is much longer of a time horizon than we need to. But it makes a very clear and compelling case. And that doesn't even account for extreme weather events, for loss of productivity, you know, for when employees have to stay home from work because of wildfire smoke or supply chains being disrupted or the health care costs associated with air pollution it doesn't even account for for those costs and so when yeah, or their town is flooded or when yeah. you're ta- exactly right all of the things that are we're already seeing so the business case is very clear but I think I, mean, I don't know that it is sufficient to 
make the change that we need to see as quickly as we need to see it. Well, I think you previously asked the million dollar question, is capitalism and climate change compatible, mm -hmm. right? And you, you pointed out, we're looking at a 20 year return, which is a 5X, which is a pretty good return on investment. But most public companies are thinking quarter by quarter, right? Right. right. So how do we bridge the gap between the long-term payback and the quarter by quarter death march that most public companies are, are on? To me, that really is the million dollar question that we have to figure out. There's people who say capitalism is not, cannot coexist in a climate safe world. But, you know, we don't have time to completely dismantle <laughs> capitalism and build a new economic system in the next seven years that will align with that. Right. We need to use the resources inside the existing system we have. And that's I mean, that's really the goal of, of our program is to acknowledge like we are in this system and there are really influential actors in this system. And so. How can we leverage the political influence, the financial influence, the human resources that these big actors have inside the system? How can we use that to accelerate climate solutions? Well, I, I think it really is a top question in the business philosophy category. My daughter asked me, just apropos of nothing last night, is it possible for you to have a company that isn't always growing, a successful company, a profitable company that's not always growing? And I said, well... But as a public company, that's a tough thing to do because investors want earnings per share to increase on a regular basis and they want to get a return. If you're a $100 million company and you're putting $25 million down in profit every year and you're stuck at $100 million, that means you're losing share and you're going to be threatened by your competitors. You know, if you're growing at the rate of inflation, then maybe that's okay, but you're still going to be losing share unless the market you're addressing is contracting. And then you're going to be losing share because it's getting smaller. And so these are not simply answered questions. I mean, Patagonia is a great example of an environmentally sound and observant company, but it's no mystery that they're privately held. Right, right. You know, so you have a lot of latitude if you're private. And then when you go to this quarter by quarter measuring stick, I've always loved the practice in Japan of the five-year plan for corporations that allow them to invest a little bit further down the path to have a longer-term view of things. And if you look at, you know, even, you know, our significant competitor, China, they're doing five and 10 and 15-year plans. Yeah. The United States doesn't do that. And in fact, the Western world's not very good at that. So I think there needs to be a little bit of a mind shift, if you will, about how much more return you can get with a little bit more patience, mm -hmm. right? Right. I mean, there's also so much possibility for new growth in new areas, right? So the 100 climate solutions that our drawdown team, you know, team of scientists and researchers looked at, we need to scale those and, you know, we need business models to transform so that there can be growth in building the world we need. And that may mean that some products or some parts of the business may need to be phased out that are not compatible with a climate safe future. You know, our research is very clear that there is tremendous business opportunity inherent in building climate solutions for the world. And so some of the businesses that we work with, we work with them on looking at, okay, Google, for example, you know, Maybe in the past, you used to use your technology to help oil companies drill more efficiently, but maybe in the future, you need to pivot to using that technology to help identify where methane leaks are happening so that we can fix those. And so, you know, I think there is, and the same thing is happening in big auto, you know, these commitments to stop internal combustion engine cars by a certain date and commit to pivoting entirely to electric vehicles. I mean, I think these kind of shifts in the entire model of the business and ideally, you know, maintaining that profit, but, you know, really being able to kind of accelerate in new areas was one potential path forward. One of the sentences in Drawdown, you know, deep, deep in the book, I think towards the end that, that kind of drew my attention, that we can make more money solving these problems today and we can mitigate the impact it's going to have on the planet and the costs we're going to bear. But getting that across in a time frame that people can appreciate so that they could say, hey, this is a return that makes sense, that's going to be a huge challenge for you, right? Yeah, that is the challenge. It's not a data problem or a science problem anymore. We have 
interrogated this from all sides. We know that it makes more sense economically and in terms of our health and equity and, you know, better quality of life. When we look at the climate solutions that we need to bring into the world, we know that that is of interest to pretty much everyone. And so I think the challenge now is making that case in terms of like what you might call like kitchen table issues. What does that look like for different industries or people in different jobs or people in different parts of the country? That's where it really matters in states, like what's happening in states and how we communicate to people in different livelihoods. I mean, I'm from from a family of like coal miners in central Pennsylvania, where, you know, I saw firsthand how when that industry and the steel industry in Pennsylvania went down, how detrimental that was. And I think we need to do a really good job of making sure that transition is done in a thoughtful way. Do you have a recent success story of how Drawdown Labs has helped a public company kind of walk through this transition? So a lot of the the work that we do with our business partners is around aligning with kind of a multidimensional approach to climate leadership, where emissions reductions is one major part, and it's step number one. But it's also looking at how the business can leverage their other influence. So their political influence, where they bank and their employees' retirement plans, where those are invested, using that as a leverage point to move capital away from extractive industries and toward climate solutions. And then we look at, as we were just discussing, sort of business model transformation and longer term thinking and and how that conversation can be moved forward. And I would say no one public company that I know of that is doing all of those things that is aligning 100 percent out of every side of the business with climate action. But there's definitely leadership happening now around how can companies offer their employees green 401ks as the default. So that, you know, all of that money that their employees are saving for retirement is not going against their sustainability goals, right? Is not being invested in fossil fuel companies, but is being invested in climate solutions. There's a lot of conversation around financed emissions for public companies, like where their corporate cash is going. Right now, it's there's no big bank that can take a company like Google's money and That is not, you know, invested in guarantee. It's not going into oil extraction or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so the question there now is, well, what can we do as a large public company? What do we do now? How do we work with banks to encourage them and to use the aggregated demand from these companies to shift banking practices? I think it's really smart of your organization to speak to the community that I'm in, you know, as business professionals, like a business professional, this is a professional plan. It's like, hey, if you follow these steps, you're going to make progress towards mitigating climate change. For me, I guess the next question is, what role do you play to the average corporation that's not a big public entity, but maybe a few hundred employees that wants to be socially conscious? Can they pull a page out of your playbook and just go implement it on their own? Or what do you recommend to a company that aspires one day to be a B Corp? The core principle of our work is really to encourage that sustainability and, you know, ESG is integrated into every part of the business. That's essentially what I think we're trying to drive. And that concept is relevant, whether you're a hundred person company or Amazon, that means that Climate action is being embedded into sales teams and maybe incentivizing certain kinds of sales over others. That means climate action is embedded into the HR job function, into legal. That makes sustainability central, whereas right now I think it's still sort of either like a skunk works project or something that's happening on the side that when there is big layoffs, it's easy to sort of deprioritize sustainability. And so, you know, I think whether you're a small company or a large publicly traded corporation, embedding climate across your business as central to the business and the business model is relevant. And so we really look for where are there opportunities to get some accountability. And you can find accountability in when you write legal contracts that require certain kinds of suppliers, you know, require that their suppliers all have emissions reductions targets or tie executive compensation to the achievement of climate targets. So things like that we really look for, you know, because emissions reductions is such a difficult thing to measure, a company's ability to reduce their emissions 
by 2040 is a very difficult thing to measure where they are in that journey on any given day. But there are other things that are measurable. And so those are the things we look at as well to help be a guide for measurable climate action. Is there an example or a gold standard within the public company space, particularly in the U.S., that you would point to and say, hey, be more like that company? I would point to a couple. I think Google is doing a great job of using their business superpower for climate action. Google is one of the world's biggest energy users, right? They have 2 billion users around the world using Google. And so using that superpower as a big energy user, they sort of embedded in their climate work that one of their goals is to green the electrical grid everywhere they operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so they made this, you know, 24 seven carbon free energy commitment. And they have been really evangelizing that idea and working with other big energy users to similarly work together to decarbonize the grid. And that will have impact far beyond Google, right? Because when the electrical grid is green, then that means that the energy that individuals use in their households, it's good for the world, not just for Google's business. Has Google made a 2030s commitment to net zero? That is a great question. I don't know that off the top of my head. Because one thing you do know off the top of your head is that 75% of the carbon reductions that we need to make, we need to make in this decade, right? That was a major finding of our work over the last year at Project Drawdown. It was sort of this moment of, holy shit, (laughs) you know, like this isn't a 2050 conversation. If 75% of the action needs to happen this decade, We were way off in talking about this as a net zero by 2050 conversation, right? And that was a big miss of the science. 2050 was a a planetary target. And then what happened was corporations were like, oh, okay, if that's a planetary target, let's make that our individual business target. But that's not how the planet works, right? We need everyone to cross the finish line by 2050 and the big emitters to get there much, much, much sooner. And every day there are greenhouse gas emissions churning into the atmosphere that are going to make it harder and harder and harder to clean up the longer we wait. And so, yes, you're absolutely right that what happens this decade is the most important thing. Well, you've got also on your list of associations, you've got Salesforce, right? So Mark Benioff, I think, has made some statements about caring about climate. How important is leadership from the top? And is he is he walking the walk? I think it's very important leadership from the top. I think both are important, you know, the grass tops and the grassroots. And we try to work at both levels, working with employees to help hold their companies accountable and equip them. But of course, you know, CEO and board level leadership is essential and will make that easier across the board. I mean, I think the one thing that that Salesforce has done that I think was really hopeful and and innovative was they're now centering a lot of their business around a product. I think it's called Net Zero Cloud that is central to their business now and is actually built in order to help other companies decarbonize. And so it's not saying we need to like cut parts of our business and we need to do less bad and we need to, you know, we're like punishing ourselves. It's actually saying, hey, what we built as our core cloud computing or, you know, CRM software is really beneficial. What if we use that in service of the climate? And so they're using their core business now to help other companies decarbonize. And I think the more that other companies can do that, can identify what their superpower is and use that to help the world get closer to our climate goals. That's where I think capitalism and climate change are going to sort of meet in the middle is is my hope if that is done well and if that is guided by science. Yeah, I'm still struggling with this notion of you standing up in a boardroom of a publicly traded company that's got billions in profits and somehow convincing them to invest hundreds of millions, if not billions, into a net zero clean climate initiative, you've taken different approaches, right? Because I think you've heard that some of that logic falls on deaf ears, right? Yeah, yeah. So you want to mobilize the workforce, you want to build from the ground up inside of companies. What else do you recommend if you're an active employee inside of a company and you want to make a difference, you know, what would you recommend to somebody? (sighs) Yeah, um, it's hard. I mean, I was very inspired by the work of the Amazon employees several years ago who 
started with a handful of people and said, wow, it's crazy that Amazon does not have any climate targets. This was before they made a big climate commitment. And they gathered 7,000 Amazon employees or more from across the business to write a letter to the board and say, we are shareholders in this company and retention matters and you having good talent matters and this issue matters to us. And here's what we would like to see Amazon do. And Whether that was directly tied to them making their climate commitment, which happened just like a couple months after that board meeting, I assume there was a strong link there that the employee kind of pressure did accelerate Amazon's decision to do that. I'm not saying this is like a call to arms for employees to push their companies publicly, but I am saying that employees have a lot of power and they're not on the hook the way executives are to show a return on investment. They're shielded from that. And so I think employees are a very powerful accountability mechanism. Yeah, building some consensus inside at the grassroots level can have a big influence on management. That's for sure. Yeah. What do you do day to day in your organization? I mean, do you engage with corporations to help them on their path to net zero? So I do a combination of strategy, and then direct engagement with our business and investor community. You know, we bring our business partners together. We try to understand where there are pain points. We're working with all of them around aligning with this more expansive and sort of multidimensional approach to corporate climate leadership. And we look for opportunities where their aggregated voice can be impactful, whether that's around policy, you know, our business partners stepped up around the Inflation Reduction Act last year. We placed a full page ad in the New York Times calling on Congress to pass bold climate policy that many of our business partners signed on to. So we look for moments where we can aggregate the influence of the businesses and investors that we work with. You know, the great thing about Drawdown, you know, both the book and your organization is that you guys are super hopeful that it's not dealing in catastrophe and, as you said, the doom and the gloom of of what climate change could be, but rather what a healthy electrified planet could look like, right? And so through your eyes, what does 2035 look like? 2035, 2035, the 2035 of my hopes looks like walkable cities with mass electrified public transit that's free looks like every building being retrofitted and electrified and connected and a clean electrical grid. 2035 to me looks like the world has aligned around a just climate future and all parts of the economy are marching toward that future together where there's not like villains and good guys whether you work inside of an oil company or inside of Salesforce or inside of a solar company, like we all have the same North Star and we have a game plan for the ultimate vision. And we have already like made significant strides toward that. But I think that's sort of like the surround sound future that I think we need where everyone is sort of aligned around the same vision and we're all in this together. I just really appreciate that we now can have the conversation about capitalism and climate, whereas I feel like for a long time that has been sort of a third rail, not being able to talk about growth, not being able to talk about, you know, potentially phasing out some parts of a business that are incompatible. That That is now a more becoming slowly um, more of a conversation. And I think that is the million dollar question. And we have to stop ignoring it and really face it head on and tackle it together. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to go there with you today. Yeah, I think the one sector where maybe it becomes a third rail topic is when you're getting into the, the oil business and being able to have a candid conversation about the positive impact that clean energy can have on the world's energy sector is a great conversation because, you know, we need to double the power production that we have today in the next 30 years. And there's a huge opportunity for Shell and Exxon and BP who are amazing engineering companies, not just in terms of drilling oil, but building infrastructure, building power plants, building grid, all these different types of things. We're going to employ more people to electrify the planet than we will ever need to drill for oil. 
maybe there's a bigger piece of pie for you to participate right. in rather than the one you're hoarding. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I, to, I think that you just, you just nailed it. I think that's exactly right. We need to figure out how to have more of those conversations and make that point much more compellingly than I think we've been able to do in the past. Well, Jamie, it's been a pleasure talking to you and I really appreciate the work that you do. And I think you guys have a great organization. Thank you so much. It's been really an honor to be here with you today, Jim. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Good Clean Energy. 